Okay, uh, welcome back to machine learning engineering. Today's lecture is about machine learning models and PyTorch modules. In this lecture, we're going to cover the fundamentals of using modules in Torch. Then we'll talk a little bit about visualization and data sets. The next few classes are going to dive into the core foundations of machine learning models. But before we do that, let's just introduce the basic notation. We're going to define a machine learning model as a parameterized function m. We call it a parameterized function because it takes a standard argument, like a normal function x, and also a set of parameters, which we'll call theta. We use the parameters to determine how we actually apply the function m to data. Now, we're going to get much more into the details of M in future lectures. For now, let's just focus on the parameters theta. Parameters play an oversized role in modern deep learning, and understanding them deeply and their data structures will be the focus of this lecture. In particular, when working with deep learning models, the parameters store all of the information that we have learned from the underlying data. And it's important to note that parameters in modern systems are both extremely large and pretty complex. Um, I mention this now because we're going to abstract away from a lot of these complex details. And I want to start by first emphasizing how important the size and structure of these parameters are. In particular, it's worth looking at this graph, which I mentioned briefly in the first lecture. This is a graph of the size of language models that have been released over the last five years. What's important to know about this graph is that the x-axis is each year of time, but the y-axis is the log-scale number of parameters. We've seen that state-of-the-art models have grown from about 94 million parameters to upwards of 175 billion parameters. This massive increase in the size of what's stored about the underlying training data has influenced a lot of the challenges in modern machine learning engineering. In addition to the large size of these parameters, it's also worth noting that they are pretty complex. If we open up a paper, even one from about a decade ago, we can see that the description of the parameters often requires several different tables, specifying different sizes and different structures of how these parameters go together. To handle parameters, we're going to need data structures to let us specify parameters in a declarative manner. In particular, we're going to aim for two different goals. We would like the specification of the parameters to be independent of the underlying implementation. If it's helpful to think about this practically, you can think about the fact that you might want to train your model with one programming language and then actually deploy it in practice in an entirely different language. In addition, we would like our parameter specifications to be compositional. That is, we don't just want one large binary blob of parameters, but we'd like the parameters to fit with the parts of the model that they belong to. This is particularly useful as one underlying model might be made up of parameters from many different research papers or different components. To do this, we're going to implement a data structure, which I'll refer to as a module tree. In this data structure, we will have an object known as a module, and each will own a set of parameters. In addition, each module will own a set of submodules, which have the same spec. The benefit of the module tree data structure is that once we train the model, we'll be able to extract all of the parameters without having to know about how the actual modules are implemented. This will also allow us to mix and match modules with different usage for different tasks and incorporate modules others have written into our system. The downside of the module system is that we'll have to separately declare the parameters from the actual implementation of the function. This can be a bit verbose in practice. Now let's see what a module actually looks like in Python. We're going to inherit our module definitions from the Minitorch module class. Let's first look at the bottom class, myModule. We write an init function for this class that first initializes the module superclass. Then it implements three different types of members. Members can be explicit parameters, members can be user data, and members can be other submodules. Parameters will implement the parameter spec. User data can be arbitrary Python objects. And type 3 submodules will have to also inherit from the Minitorch module class. So in this example here, the class other module also inherits from module, and it has its own parameter. The PyTorch module system is aware 
that submodule A and submodule B both inherit from module, and so it keeps track of this information. When we talk about parameters, for now we're going to think about them as things that get learned as part of the machine learning system. We have to mark them as parameters so that the rest of our code knows it can update them and learn about them in practice. We'll learn a lot more about parameters in the next couple lectures. Submodules consist of other modules that were implemented and stored as members of the original module class. These are defined recursively and can build up arbitrary tree structures. Finally, modules can store other data that might be useful for keeping track of the size or shape of the module itself. This data is ignored by PyTorch or MiniTorch. You can include any arbitrary additional information. The key function that we will use to collect the module structure is known as named parameters. If we define a module like my module in the previous slides, we can call named parameters to extract all the individual parameters, both of the module and of the underlying submodules. Here's an example where we define three modules, module two, module three, and module four. Each of these will include various examples of submodules and parameters. Finally, we declare a module one, which in its init function creates a member with a parameter with value five, as well as two submodules, A and B, of type module two and module three. Calling name parameters on module one then expands all three parameters the one for this instance of module one, as well as the parameters corresponding to the instance of module two called A and module three called B. PyTorch cheats a little bit to do this. It uses the fact that all modules inherit from the base module class to encode some logic that spies on your init function to find parameter and module objects. Internally, it stores these in a special list and it implements named parameters to search over these lists. It does this using special Python magic methods to make this work in practice. You'll have to implement this on the homework, so it's worth thinking about how these work in practice. Python utilizes magic methods that start with two underscores. These are used to override default behavior in the language. We're going to use them here to override the behavior for set attribute which allows us to spy on new members being added to self. We'll additionally see these later in the class when we implement operator overloading, which will be the core idea we'll use for auto differentiation. We see them for the first time here, and you'll have to look these up in practice or use something like ChatGPT to explain them to you. Here's what the interception code actually looks like. When you call set adder on your module class, it's basically going to override the set function check for parameters or modules, and add them to a special list, parameters and modules. This also allows it to set special parameter naming. In particular, in addition to a name within the actual instance itself, there will be a global name for each parameter. To set this global name, we'll get an address of the parameter based on its position in the module tree. Names are set by walking from the bottom instance and looking at the name that was given to each submodule as we go. The full name for every parameter consists of the path from the root of the tree to this parameter and then its value. Let's end this section by looking at some real world examples of how these modules are implemented in practice. So this is code taken from a real world language model implementation at PyTorch. We'll cover the actual implementation of this later in the class but for now, let's just look at how different modules are added in the init function. So this particular class is called block. It's a subclass of the PyTorch module class. Internally, it first calls the super init function and then declares several different submodules. So in particular, we see both submodules that are defined by PyTorch, such as nn.layerNorm, as well as submodules that are defined within the code base itself such as attention and MLP. You can basically go through and read the declarative definition of the parameters of most major machine learning models this way. Here's another example for image classification. This block is known as inception three, and it's again uh, inherited from the NN module base class. Here we define several different convolutional blocks, 
These take various different sizes, but are implemented as submodules. In fact, this class implements the table that we saw earlier in this class, and we can see how the complex tables defined within machine learning papers turn into different submodule structures within the actual Torch code. Let's end the lecture today by talking a bit about some of the visualization tools that are included within the Mini Torch framework. These will give you ways to look into and understand some of the structures that you're building in practice. So practically, we built these visualization tools to give you a sense of the properties of the machine learning models that you're building as you code, as well as seeing real-time graphs for how you train models. Throughout the assignments, we're going to have you construct figures that demonstrate that your model was actually able to learn on data and that the underlying structures that you built were correct. For these tools, you'll be using Streamlit, which is a Python graphical user interface that allows you to build various different dashboards or toolkits to look into your code. You can run this with the command streamlit run app.py followed by two dashes and the name of the mini torch module that you're using. So for module zero, you'll just include the argument zero. The actual code for streamlit is relatively simple. You just import the streamlit toolkit and you write various commands that will print things to the screen itself. If you look through the code that we provided you for module zero, you'll see that we have little dashboards to both look at each of the functions you've implemented, as well as to draw some of the module trees in real time and see what your code returns. There are a couple of gotchas that you need to look out for in practice when using our visualizer. If you change the code of the visualization itself, then Streamlit will auto-update your web browser. However, changes to the underlying mini torch library will not cause the library to auto update. So you might need to actually tell it to update and run again. The last thing you'll need to know for the first homework is how to load and visualize data sets. This is a sneak peek for what we'll do in the second part of the class. But in task 0.5, you'll actually have to start working with the machine learning problem. For this problem, you'll be working on the problem of separating points into multiple classes. You can think about this as manually implementing your first machine learning classifier. For this task, you'll be able to play with several different data sets. Each of these correspond to arranging a set of points on a 2D grid and then trying to separate these with a the line. In practice, you'll be tuning several different knobs. These include two weights and a bias and this will be the focus of our next lecture. If you are in and want to get a start on these problems, you can also check out this link here, which goes to the TensorFlow Playground. You can also Google this to find the playground itself. It's a very nice tool, and it will give you intuition about where we're going in terms of machine learning. That concludes lecture 0.2. Please ask any questions you may have in the YouTube comments, and additionally, we'll have a forum link if you have any other issues in practice. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll see you again for Module 1.1.